Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, and I'm getting over a cold, so I probably sound a little bit different, and I'm probably going to be mostly unconscious by the time we're done with this. Uh, and joining us is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Jason, you sound a lot better than I thought you would, so yeah. <laughs> kudos to you. <laughs> well, we've been sitting here talking for a little while, and I think that kind of cleared up my my general bleh, a little bit so <laughs> excellent i wish we had been recording because the, i'm I'm afraid the first part of the podcast we didn't record is going to be even better than the actual thing we're recording <laughs> because as you know and our guests are about to learn our special guest today is jeff Curtinacker. he's in the house hey Woo-hoo. everybody hey i can't <laughs> hear you jeff oh you I can't, can't? I can't. She Is can't. there a way oh, I can? Oh, you, She's yeah. playing a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now I hear you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just he started off with, idea. yeah, Bruce Ornsby on the range today when he came onto our little, you know, podcast that made me I happy. I flagged as a uh, copyright if I play it, so. Oh, no. No, no, no. We'll just mess it up a little bit. <laughs> Oh, I that's, the way I, that's my that's my jam. It's been a while. It's good to see everybody. I haven't been here in a while. Yeah, um, glad to have you, Jeff. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know Jeff Curtinacker, he was our fearless composer for the Girl Who Wore Freedom. He is also contracted verbally, at any rate, to uh, compose for all of our other projects. <laughs> yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't know that, but it is a verbal contract. I'd be happy to. He, it's going to happen, Jeff. It's going to happen. Uh, so he is an incredibly talented uh, musician. He should be scoring a lot more films than he actually is at the moment. So I'm going to give a pitch for Jeff. If you are listening, you're a filmmaker and you need an unbelievable score. I got the guy for you. And after you hear him on this podcast, uh, you'll know I'm right. See what I mean? <laughs> so talented. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i appreciate the little plug that helps yeah all right jason I, I can attest jeff is awesome to work with uh oh, a little look at that. bit two two, two. Yeah, the little bit of work i've done with jeff has been just absolutely incredible and i'm looking forward to doing some more wow. yeah well why don't you tell us what he is doing for you and that can give us a little bit of insight into how we can support what you're doing uh, yeah, yeah. So um, for a while, uh, Sean, um, who is my creative partner, he and I made a animated sketch show and we did some sketches. We had uh, Jeff come in and do sound effects and music uh, for that. And that was a really fun little project because everyone was like, you know, like 10, 20, 30 seconds. And Jeff would come in and just make it really epic and uh, add a lot of fun and flavor to it. And it was it was really fun. Can we see those still? Yeah, yeah, there's still some of them up on uh, Instagram. We're trying to figure out what what the best thing to do with them is. Um, so, yeah, that's part of what we're trying to figure out this year. Okay, and uh, what's your Instagram handle? Uh, J-A-X-A-N-D-C-H-A-W-N, Jax and Chon. And in part of what we're trying to figure out is because that's really hard to understand. and no one. Can. <laughs> so when you say it to people, they go, huh? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, we're we're, Re- we're working on a rebrand rebranding is a thing, you know. It's yeah. it's a thing and uh we had to do it ourselves. Now we are documentary first a uh, production simply because it just once you step back and you look what you're doing uh, and you realize sometimes uh the things you thought of at first probably weren't the greatest and you know, a redo is fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's- why they always put working title after all yeah. of these notes. <laughs> The greatest movie ever told, working title. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Anyway, all right. So we have a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Jason, why don't you sort of tee it up for us? Yeah. So uh, Christian brought this topic. I think, Christian, you were the one who brought the topic up, right? Or was I certainly, well, I certainly was because Jeff and I had a, you know, kind of our own little horror story uh, regarding this issue. So figure we need to talk about. Christian recommended that we talk about the dreaded music cue sheet, what it is and what to do with it. Yeah, I don't know if it's dreaded. I think it's dreaded in the sense that it's another thing for people to keep track of in book, you know, in their in their bookkeeping of making a movie. Um, But for the people it benefits, you know, it actually is a very, very cool thing to have. Um, But um, but, you know, what what having 
never done films before uh, until I met Christian and this is her first film too. So we were all a little bit in the dark of what it is. Like I had heard of them and I knew people that talked about them, but I never had to fill one out um, or have it benefit me in any way. And so basically what it is, it's just a, it's a sheet that you submit that has the, um, a name for every piece of music in the film and the time code at which it, that piece of music starts and ends. Um, and so normally, you know, you sit down with the director and they tell you, we want music in here and out here and in here and out here. And then, you know, the composer does that. And um, I wasn't naming anything. So I just was calling things functionally what they are. Um, but so I went back and gave everything like a name for the piece of music that's in the film, each track, and then the in point and out point. Um, and then you have to assign it's it, it, you have to assign um, who the composer is. Are there any other rights associated with it? Like if, some, if it's a song, did someone write it? Who's the publisher? Um, because at the end of the day, this all goes to a performing rights uh, organization that will collect your royalties and ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or somebody that will uh, collect royalties of performances or uh, showings of this film or TV show on your behalf. And so um, that's the function of why it's there, but it's having never done one, we kind of, I don't know, we kind of were just sort of feeling our way through it and it, we, we got it done in the end, but. We did, but the reason I call it the dreaded music cue sheet is because I too had heard about it for a really long time in the producer world, but never had to have do anything with it. And so I didn't understand um, you had to educate me, but you didn't know either. So we kind of figured it out together. And I assumed that when I gave it to the distributor, because it is one of the deliverables that a distributor will ask for, I assumed that the distributor was going to then submit the music cue sheet. Well, with our first distribution experience with the company that will go unnamed, uh, we, Jeff said, hey, when are they going to submit the music cue sheet? I hope our new distributor gets that taken care of. And so I started doing some research on that and I thought, huh, who is supposed to do that? It turns out, guess what? It was the producer's responsibility. <laughs> so um, I didn't really know what to do. And I said, hey, Jeff, how do I do this? And basically Jeff did it himself. <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, I filled it out um, because that makes I think it makes a lot of sense if you're either the, the music editor, the composer, someone who's familiar with the cues and the ins and outs of where they take place in the film, um, just because they, they, they give you a form to fill out. So you're, it's not just the Wild West of of a spreadsheet. Um, so it, it does go pretty quick. You just have to be organized enough to know which piece of music belongs where and how long does it last and stuff like that. And so. Um, that was really the most challenging part was because our film has a lot of music cues and they often sort of dovetail into each other. And I was like, is that one cue or two cues or what should we do with that? So those are the hardest decisions. Yeah. And ultimately, like Jeff was saying, let's just sort of expand this a little bit. It is a tool that is to track any music that's ever created, whether it's just instrumental music whether there are lyrics to it. And typically, those people that create that music are supposed to be paid, not only kind of upfront, but every time it's used anywhere, there's to be paid royalties. And there is, a, you know, several, I think, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some of these rights management organizations, but the like primary one is ASCAP, right? I don't even ASCAP know what ASCAP and BMI. Uh, ASCAP and BMI, yeah. So you're supposed to submit that music cue sheet to ASCAP, right? Can you talk a little bit about that process? What did that look like? Yeah, uh, and actually ASCAP and BMI have sort of, um, there's a thing they kind of all use now called rapid cue. And so um, rather than having to submit a cue sheet to each organization, you, it's once they've streamlined it to one-stop shopping, so you can submit it to um, Rapid Q, which is what I, I I had done initially, and then I think BMI had a situation where they contacted you, uh, Christian, individually, and then you had to resubmit to them. Oh, from, that's right. From you, but um, normally, um, if you just submit it to this Rapid Q um, organization, or I don't know if it's a, it's it's a. It's actually it's actually like a 
a platform, a tool that yeah. they have used. Yeah. And then everybody gets to, it, it gets distributed to all the right people, which is, it makes our lives a lot easier. Um, but yeah, the, the two big ones being ASCAP and BMI and ideally they say it's very helpful to have someone that you are connected with or someone that you can at least contact on the inside of ASCAP or BMI, someone that you can say, um, who's, you know, technically those places are looking out for you, the composer, musician, songwriter, fill in the blank. Um, Singer. So, yep. Yeah, so they are, they're there for, you know, to have your back. So if you have a relationship or with someone or someone that you can reach out to there, or even maybe just say, Hey, uh, I submitted this. I just want to let you know, and they can just make sure on their end, since you have submitted it to rapid queue, they can double check on their end. Yep. We got it. You're all good. Um, and since you got an email right from BMI saying, Hey, we need a couple adjustments, um, that lets me know they got it. So, um, it does take a while for it to show up. Um, and I also noticed, like, I don't know exactly how the royalties will work. I know that broadcast organizations, you know, television channels, cable channels, they have to pay licensing fees and, and broadcast uh, fees. And so, but this film is not on broadcast television or cable. So the streaming services has something that's really come in a huge in the last you know decade. I'm not really sure, you know, what happens with the streaming services. Um, I'm sure it's tracked in some way. I just don't know if it's the same way as broadcast television. So how on your end, you're the composer and I'm sure you've created other music that you've had to submit through this music cue sheet process. Do you have an account at like ASCAP where you're tracking any of royalties that come through for you? What does it look like on your end? I do have I uh, years ago, man, before I even probably should have had an account at ASCAP, I got one. Um, and so I have a composer songwriter account and I have a publisher account and um, that way any self-published music I was I had put out or was planning to put out um, I could mark myself as the composer or the songwriter and I could also mark myself as the publisher since I published you know it myself I think people who do books are very similar situation you're the author but if you're also self-published you have maybe a, a publishing company or something that you set up um, on that end and so I have both of those registered with ASCAP and um, I really haven't had any, I've never seen one check for anything I've done, but no one's, even though I can, I can send them music and say, Hey, you know, this is um, it's, it's copyright material. And uh, just let's keep track of anything ever uses this piece of music, but I've never had music placed in a trailer or in a TV show or in a commercial or anything like that. So they, I have things registered with them, but they've never had to actually do anything because none of my music has been used in that way, um, unfortunately. So the way it would typically work. So I can talk about it from the filmmaker's point of view with other music that we used in the film. And this was a completely new animal to me. I stumbled my way through this rights part of it the entire time, even including like recently, because I had no idea where to start. And typically there are people on movies that this is their job, managing the managed rights and making sure that you get the licenses for those to use um, in, you know, uh, as you publish or distribute this product. So in our film, we have uh, things that do have managed rights. And what that means is somebody else owns this piece of property and we are licensing this piece of property in order to use it in our film. And we are going to pay a fee for the freedom to use this in our film. And there is, in each of these instances, an organization that is managing those rights to make sure that the people that own the property are getting paid. So in The Girl Who Wore Freedom, uh, the man the pieces of art that we have that are managed, um, in the beginning, there's a... a I think it may be, I don't know, two and a half minutes total of a black and white interview with a Frenchman. And this was a news interview that was um, shot in the 60s that was part of a news organization's library that they then sold to a media house in Paris that then owns this little clip of this thing. So it was something that was created completely for free 
that a newspaper or a news organization owned. And then somebody just bought that and put it online until I discovered it and was like, oh my gosh, that's key to my story. Yeah, it took place in 1966. But in order to use that little piece, I've had to pay this media house thousands of dollars in order to use it in our film so that we are free to broadcast it. And we only have a limited amount of time to use that. I think the um, time period for us is maybe 10 or 12 years, something like that. So if the film is still out, I have to pay that over again. The same is true with music. We have a minute of a song that was written in 1943. um, And it's... um, South of the Border. It was written by a person. It was played by musicians. And it was sung by a singer. So that's three different people that composed this song in 1943. I thought it was so long ago, surely I can use that for free. I was certainly wrong. It took me a very long time to figure out who even owned the rights to this movie or this music. And it went through so many different places, like from who owned it originally to where it finally ended up. And so I learned from the beginning, I had to learn the difference between music rights and or publishing rights and sync rights. Mm -hmm. And so everybody in this song gets paid somehow, whether it's the writer of the words the creator of the music and the singer of the song. And even though it was created in 1943 and nobody's ever used it, uh, you know, since 45 probably, and certainly may not use it anywhere going forward, these organizations that now own it, and in our situation, it is um, Reservoir Media owns the uh, publishing rights and Sony owns the, Um, sync rights, the synchronization rights, um, I have to pay both of them in order to use this one minute of music in our film. And I can only do it for a limited amount of time. So the film organization and the um, music organizations, they are not going to give you in perpetuity, which every independent filmmaker like me wants, uh, they're, I, meaning I give them a certain amount of money and I can use it for as long as I want to use it in any place where I want to use it. I have to say to these people that own the rights for these pieces of art, I want to use it in these different places. This is exactly how much of it I'm using and where it falls in my film. And I want to use it for this link of length of time. And I have to go negotiate the price for that. So with these companies, uh, the other thing that they have, the music publishing companies, they use what's called the one nation's rule. Basically, the publisher will set the price of whatever it is, and, and the sync group will match that. So truthfully, Um, They have to get paid the exact same thing because of this one nation's rule. Um, That's another thing I didn't know. And, you know, they will only give it to you for a certain amount of time. So that money that I pay to Reservoir Media or to Sync or to INA, the French house, sadly, it no longer really goes to the musicians that made the music. It goes to the people that bought the music, I suppose, unless there are any heirs of those people that created the the music. Um, And let's just say there were. Let's say there were heirs of people that created the song that I'm using. I would pay that to Reservoir Media and to Sony. They would then take their cut for managing the rights, and then they would pass out whatever it is to the heirs or to the, you know, trust that owns or that came after the people that made the music. And then they would get a check from ASCAP or BMI or whoever. That's sort of like the trail. Am I right, Jeff? Did I miss anything? Yeah, that's right. I mean, but somewhere along the line, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere along the line, someone would have had to, you know, sell or the yes, right yes. to Reservoir. So you kind of, in the, in the way you phrase it, you kind of feel bad for the musicians. And I think there are cases where the songwriters definitely get you know, sort of scooped out of a deal because of either bad management or a bad contract. Um, and they lose out 
on a lot of future royalties. But sometimes um, people are like, oh, you're going to pay me $50,000 for my two albums worth of music. Well, you know, I'm not really that famous. That's not, I can't really see anybody using this anyways. I'll take the money now and rather than bet on future royalties. But someone like a reservoir might be going, mm, I think we would rather bet on someone <laughs> in the next lifetime using this, these songs somewhere and we can make money off of it. And so, um, but yeah, it does kind of get through this chain of command of succession. It's not always a a done sealed deal that just because someone has passed away or because the music is a certain number of years old that it's public domain and free use. There, um, I still go, man. I, I work a lot with like hymns and in classical pieces, and I go, like I feel like it's public domain, but I should just check, you know. And, <laughs> and most times it is, but sometimes you may be surprised that it's not. Um, because the estate of the composer, even though he's been dead 300 years, um, has been willed, you know, the rights and the um, the copyrights have been willed down through generations and they haven't given them up. So um, it's always good just to check. And there's lots of public domain um, websites that you can just search and see, does this piece of music written by this person, is it public domain or is it uh, is it not? And when he talks about public domain, what he is talking about is there is this law that says after a piece of create, you know, a created piece is a certain number of years old. And Jason, you can figure this out while I'm talking, maybe 72 years, maybe it's 100 years. I don't remember what it is, but it's a certain number of years. And usually it encompasses a person's lifetime. Uh, after that period of time, whatever that person created or was created is now free to use without anything being paid for it. So for example, and every certain, I think every year, um, new things are released into the public domain. So recently it was, um, I think I read, it was all the Winnie the Pooh characters um, or ha you know, happy birthday at one point or Disney, uh, Mickey Mouse, I think is coming up for being in the public domain. I'm not exactly sure, but I do know just a whole tranche of things were just released into the public domain that a lot of people wanted. It's happened with, you know, Jason, you're researching. I see you're found something. What are you finding? Yeah. So it's generally a hundred years for any work that was released. Um, <clears throat> so right now it'd be before uh, 1923. So it seems like it's generally the rules a hundred years. It is. It's uh, like a, yeah. they want to make sure a lifetime has passed before yeah. Um, that can go. And Jeff, you're right. You make a very good point. Artists or creators could sell off their stuff and they want the money right then. Uh, and then somebody will scoop in and buy it. And then it is owned by a corporation. Uh, it is also true that musicians or publishers or filmmakers can then put whatever they've created. It's what I'll do. They'll put it into a trust. Uh, and that way the heirs can benefit if anything from comes in. It is a very complicated thing dictated by contracts, a lot of legal contracts. And um, and it does, yeah, oh, it takes some ferreting out. <clears throat> Real quick, the... Um... You know, I was listening to the woes of, you know, of how detailed you had to be. I want to use this part of the music in this case, you know, this part of the film. And <clears throat> it's it sounds very tedious, but in my experience, it's there to protect the integrity of whatever you're licensing or whatever you want to use. So that way you just don't pay a ton of money to, you know, use Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire and it ends up in a hemorrhoid commercial. And then, then his legacy is like, oh, wait, what? Like, <laughs> so I think it, the, the idea would be that they need to know exactly like, is this, if it's matching up with something visually or an idea, or you're trying to sell something, they want to make sure it's in line with maybe what the artist or what the, the aesthetic of the song um, would go with. And so it, it is tedious, but I'd like to think that it's there to protect the integrity of whatever work you're trying to license. Yeah, absolutely. When I had to, you have to fill out an application. So with Reservoir Media and with Sony, I had to fill out a whole application with INA um, FR in France. I had to um, give them exactly the exact time amount of pieces I was going to use it, where I was going to use it, what the whole story was of the entire film, what the purpose was of the film. With the songs, they want to know exactly how long and they want to know what it's in relation to, what is the story, uh, you're 100% right because they want to protect the integrity of that created 
work. Um, but it was just fascinating to me that that all still was at play, uh, you know, 80 years after the music had been created and the people were not here anymore. Yeah. You know, Sony Music, Reservoir Media still cares about that. Yeah. And the interesting thing is the, you are not only you had to pay them money to use it, we also had to include that track on the cue sheet and then list Reservoir Media as a publisher. And so if let's say if this gets on, if that film were to be on uh, the History Channel and they get broadcast royalties, which then ASCAP and BMI would collect and parse out, since they're listed on the cue sheet, then now they're going to get a cut of that, too. It may not be very much, but at least, you know, it's a little bit of a double dip. You have to pay to use it, and then they will still get residuals based on broadcast royalties, which is pretty fast. I'm trying to build my life so I can get more of that mailbox money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> we all need that mailbox money. It also <laughs> reminded me what you just said reminds me of what uh, – what I learned watching the Go-Go's movie, which is one of my favorite documentaries. I saw it at Sundance with, well, no, not with Jeff. No, no, I dropped you off. But <laughs> Sundance, I was just such a flood of memories because it's happening right now. Or it's ending right I now. Know. And I, know. I just got all the emails for the past week. And I was like, oh, man, that was so fun. It was. Aren't you glad I made you come? I'm it so was <laughs> so fun. And I told yeah. you it wouldn't turn out like you hoped it would. But I knew it would still be worth the money and the time I to come. Yeah, my favorite part was crying in the car. That was my favorite part. Yeah, I was crying in the car after the movie. Isn't that right? No, I was crying in the car when we <laughs> arrived. And then that's when you told me, like, this isn't going to work out like you expect. Because we, I was so nervous <laughs> about the week. I had so much expectations. You were excited uh, about, yeah, the Go-Go's. I think you said you cried during the oh. movie that we got to ask him a question. Yeah, but the Go-Go's were, um, I I've loved them. Uh, they were just my favorite band in high school. I had no idea that the Go-Go's movie was there coming out when I was at Sundance. I had no idea they were going to be there. So I was actually in some other uh, like panel and they all walked right by me, uh, you know, enough so I could touch them. And they looked at me and they let me ask them questions. And, oh, I was over the moon. But what I learned from their movie is their breakup happened over this exact thing that we're talking about. You know, early on, they were just a group of girls who wanted to make music and they were all about this making music and having fun and living their life and bonding together and everything was happy-go-lucky until one of them started getting a bigger paycheck than all the rest of them. And why happy, was that? Happy go-go-lucky. <laughs> happy go-go-lucky. Well, that was because one of them ended up writing the majority of the music and people that write the words and own that, you know, copy, they're the ones that end up making the music because it is their created work or making the money because it's their created work. The singer, she's just, uh, you know, she's just singing. She's not really creating anything, you know, spectacular. And the musicians are playing the music that had already been written. So it is the one, the songwriter, that is making a ton of cash every single time that that plays. And the Go-Go's didn't find that out until it was far too late in their career. Other people wanted to write the music, and it wasn't as good. And they were, of course, the drugs also played a part in all of that breakup and, you know, stuff. Uh, but I had no idea there was that kind of disparity between the writer or somebody composing the music and the singer. Oh, yeah. The songwriters, they're the ones that definitely get the big paydays, um, especially nowadays. I think, you know, if you're in a band, there's no no one's buying music anymore. So um, you have to tour and sell merchandise and things like that. But I always wonder how bands like Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin, U2, how bands stick together for so long because there is, you know, usually it's, it's one or two of the guys in the band that are writing the songs. Um, but there has to be a good either understanding that like the bass player isn't really doing very much. And so he doesn't get paid as much. Or I've heard of people where it's like, if you're in the room, when we write this song, like you're getting credit, just, we're not, we don't want any lawsuits or anything. So if the band is there and they're working it through, I'll do this and you do that, then everyone gets writing credit and they share it all equally. And I think that's probably the most equitable way to approach it just to avoid future 20 years later. You're like, I think I wrote that line and they're like, no, you didn't. I wrote it. And 
it's got to be difficult to maintain those long-term uh, bands. Yeah, for sure. What were you going to say, Jason? Nothing. You're just nodding along. No, no. I, I, I was thinking about, um, I remember hearing a story about Coldplay um, when they started to have problems, they brought in, they like called him Bono and were like, please, you know, like help us figure out like how we can you know, make this work. And like, <laughs> I love Coldplay. Coldplay so good. Uh, so, so they brought in Bono, and he was like, "Well, you guys, you're not friends anymore. Like, you're you're making music, but you're not actually being friends. You're not, and, you know, that sort of thing." And so they they started playing video games together again, and like intentionally forcing themselves to be friends again instead of, you know, just working together. And yeah. that's part of how they were able to get together. But that was one of the big things Bono did was just like have a Bring relationship outside of the monetary relationship you need to. Otherwise, it'll just fall apart. Brilliant. And listen to this music they made. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. I I'll get taken down like for copyright violation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's amazing. Uh really what's at the bottom of this music cue sheet stuff is all about money when it comes down to it, tracking money, protecting the artist, you think, but in the end, it's really the corporations, very kind of sad. Uh, and I think um, it's important to fill out those music cue sheets, fill them out correctly. I do think it's important that musicians get paid. I really pray that people will hear your music in our movie and want to license a, a, you know, a song or a phrase or whatever. I don't know if it'll happen, but yeah, I'm pulling for you, I don't Jeff. know that it will either, but um, I appreciate that. It's good to have people rooting for me i'll take it <laughs> yeah so all right if you are a, a producer or a director or any sort of filmmaker you really need to think twice about this music that you're using in your film uh i just can't stress enough how challenging it is to use music that has already been made to get the rights for that the money that it costs uh and even you know even with people that are creating music for you, uh, they need to track it. They need to make sure that they um, and, and truthfully, Jeff, you have the we negotiated that you have the right to do whatever you want to do with the music in our movie. So I don't know if you can put it somewhere. And yeah, I have a I have an EDM album, a remix of all the soundtrack coming out later next year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. dubstep is what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it is, you know, seeing the other side of it. Um, all I can think about when I see movies like Sing or Sing 2, you know, is this has to be so expensive. Just the licensing of all these songs alone. So when you see a movie that's got just a ton of popular songs in it. Oh, man, I just think. That's where all the budget went. Is that is why movie budgets are astronomically high. Like people don't think about that at all when they're making a movie. They just think, oh, this would be great. We can use this song or else they go into the movie and it is in the budget from the very beginning. We're going to use all these amazing songs. Uh, we've got the budget for this. Uh, but and it is still in that there is still tons of negotiating skills afterwards for how you negotiate these rights and what you pay for them. And there is a huge business around music rights management uh, with people working for films. Um, and the common person that's not a filmmaker uh, probably has run into this with any of these reels that you see on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, because you'll see there's free music that you can put to your little reel, right? And it is a popular, famous, whatever. Somebody is getting royalties for that music, even though you can use it in Instagram and Facebook. Maybe they've paid those royalties so that people can use it inside the app. But what I do know is that if you're going to take that little reel that you made and you're going to use take it outside of Instagram and do something else with it, the music does not go. And I did just learn that this week because Marcio Barrera, who owns Wild Footage, um, I think Wild Footage Stories, I'm not sure what it is, but he was our photographer 
and behind the scenes photographer in France. And he made this wonderful reel for us this, this past week. And I wanted to repost it. He gave it to me and he said, yeah, Instagram strips off the mu- music. Sorry. So I went to Jeff and was like, Hey Jeff, um, can you help us out with this? So that's because uh, they don't want that music to be used outside of that world without any remuneration. And, you know, you mentioned about the filmmakers um, just a minute ago. And I think um, as a, as a composer and a musician, I will say, and a, and a lover of movies, um, it's obviously cheaper to go the route of custom music um, to have someone write a song for your end credits or to write a song for this and that. Um, I would say the only time that I would be excited about if I'm a filmmaker excited about licensing something is if you need to carry the nostalgia or the weight of whatever that song is and the, and enhances the impact of your shot or your scene, like nothing else can, and you have to have it, then you're going to have to open up your wallet and make it happen. But if you just like the song, you're like, I just like the groove. I think it's great. You're actually better off just getting someone to maybe sound like this or create me a track that has the same emotional tone because um, that's a lot cheaper, but I can understand if you're like, man, in this trailer, Elton John's rocket man is going to make it. When I saw that ant man, the new ant man movie, and they, they have the rocket man by Elton John. It's like, it made me so happy. And I don't know why, but they're leveraging a nostalgic trigger in yes. you emotionally that nothing else is going to satisfy. Absolutely. And yep. So someone put it in and they go, we love this. And now they can't live without it and you have to pay for it. And so that's the time when you go, I'm going to dig deep and license it because nothing else is going to satisfy this itch like this song. But I think there's plenty of times if you can see past it where you actually can get satisfied by doing something similar. That's a super, super good point. And now we all know why Elton John is so rich. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're actually, you're singing my song, Jeff, because that is exactly the case of what happened in the girl who wore freedom. That French piece, the black and white French news piece that I used in the girl who wore freedom without that piece, my story does not stand up. It was almost the like key linchpin, most important story. That was the epitome of epitome example of what I was trying to tell and the message I was trying to get across in my film. I had to have it because when it came down to it, Um, if I took it out, it would completely compromise the integrity of the movie. So I knew that I had to come up with the money because there was no way I could do it. Now, the South of the Border music that was created in 1943, this was a judgment call because this song, I was only licensing a minute, I could have taken it out. And I wrestled with this so many times because it's not crucial to the storytelling. I really could have gotten rid of it. But my wonderful sound design and mix guy, Jason Hoban, had woven it into the story so much that I couldn't get it out of my head. And it's this one minute where Danny, um, the heroine of our story, sings this song that she heard a GI sing in 1943. And all she sings is the chorus, which is, oh, Mexico way. That's it. That's all she sings. And... I then was like, ooh, I wonder if we could find that song anywhere. And I started Googling archives and trying to figure out the title of it. And I was so proud of myself when I found it. And I thought for sure it was in the public domain, but I was wrong. And I then had to go down this journey of trying to figure out how to use this legally in my movie. And because it is so old, it is not that expensive, but for it was like, I don't know, for the film festival rights, it was $1,000. And now for the next, I don't know how many years, 10 maybe, it's going to be another 1,000 publishing and 1,000 sync rights. Um, so it's not tremendously expensive. But in my situation, it was a lot of money to pay for a song that wasn't critical to the story. But in the end, the way that Jason wove it together and the nostalgia that that song of it being sung with her singing under, you know, it's sing, it's underneath her singing those words. For me, it just made it, it fits so beautifully that I didn't want to get rid of it. So mm-hmm. you're right. It's a judgment call. Can you live without this? Can you not live without this? Do you have the money to pay for it? Do you want somebody else to create something like it? Um, those are all questions and decisions that a director and a producer have to make together. And the happy medium might be 
it's cheaper to actually have someone cover. Let's say you just love the lyrics or something like you're talking about um, where Danny sings the lyrics. <clears throat> you're buying, you know, a recording of, so you're buying a package, the musicians, the recording, the singer. And sometimes it's, it's better to just work out the rights to cover the song and then you're paying the person to cover. And so like <clears throat> you wouldn't want me to cover it, but let's say I did cover it. Now all you have to do is pay for the rights to make a cover. And then I'm going to let you use it in perpetuity for $1 million. No, I'm going to, I'm going to let you use it for as long as you want. Um, so now you get, you don't get the original recording, but you get <clears throat> the emotional tone of the song sung by another artist. And sometimes that's a great way to go too. Um, if you know someone who could do a cover of it, then you just have to work out the rights to the cover song. But now you're paying this whole other entity in, in, and not have to go through the whole system that you just talked about. So that's um, that's kind of a, a middle of the road option between having it and not having it. Yes. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't even think about that middle of road option, but it absolutely exists. So thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, Jason, do you have any questions that I hadn't thought about? No, I uh, I think you guys have covered pretty much anything. I've chimed in when I did, and I think uh, I think we're pretty much good. And you, you've said enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm tired. I, but I do have something for my DocuView Deja Vu actually because oh. of this conversation. Oh, oh fantastic! Oh, DocuView Deja Vu coming up right after this. No, <laughs> and you would think we would have a commercial there, but <laughs> that goes back to my old news days. No, we don't. Um, however. Before we began this conversation, we were talking offline, as we often do. And Jeff, you told me that you had something on your mind, something you've been mulling around, turning around in your head. Talk to me about that. How long is this podcast? I don't want to. I don't want to set it into overtime. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe actually, we could have Jeff back again and do a whole episode on that. Oh, that's so great! I love that, that idea. Be, that Jeff, will it it's will it still tease. be on your mind next week? Yes. That's always on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. We will say that. And now it is time for DocuView Deja Vu. DocuView Deja Vu. All right, ladies and gents. I that live, are... I had I thought about it. Oh, well, let's try it again because Jason Ruggs is going to edit this episode. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just would, I would have had to learn it again. I don't remember how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everything's okay. falling apart. we're like always on the edge of greatness and then it all falls apart yeah, anyway yeah, yeah. It's always, oh we could have been so good but we're not <laughs> <laughs> we do have aspirations to be better if you're listening to this hang on hang on we're going to make this podcast even better take it to new heights so don't go away we need you we all, all three listeners please don't stop listening <laughs> Okay, DocuView Deja Vu coming right up. Um, I'm going to start because this movie was so impactful to me. I have to share it. For probably, I would say, I don't know, six months or more, my husband, um, and truthfully, it's not a documentary. It's a docu-series. My husband has been wanting to watch Meltdown Three Mile Island. And to me, I was like, why do I want to watch that? It doesn't, it sounds depressing. It doesn't sound very interesting. But I've learned, we've had several instances like this where he's like, I really want to watch this. And I've learned that I love documentaries. So it kind of doesn't matter what the subject is. I get drawn in in like the first three minutes. And then I'm curious about what's happening. So this story is about the meltdown in Pennsylvania. Uh, of Three Mile Island back in 19, the early 1980s. It talks about it's when nuclear um, nuclear fusion was new. We were trying to figure out how to harness it for power. And we hadn't got all the kinks worked out of that yet and what the impacts of that would be for our society. If there was an accident, we didn't know how to stop it. Uh, this docu-series is masterfully done, woven together so well, uh, super informational, very informative. Uh, it's just, it's really, really great. So um, I really highly recommend it. It is on Netflix. It's a three-hour total uh, history. Uh, the logline is insiders recount the events, co uh, controversies, and lingering effects of the accident of a Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. Uh, I just would love you guys to watch, comment, let us know what you think. I think it's awesome. So uh, that's my recommendation. And now to you, Jeff. 
Uh, so I haven't, I, I don't have a ton of free time lately, so I haven't watched anything recently. So my apologies. But um, one thing, I watched it super late to the party because uh, it came out a while ago. But I haven't been able to really stop thinking about it. I only watched it a couple months ago. And that was the Chernobyl um, series on HBO. And I don't really know if it's documentary as more of a dra- dramatized historical narrative. But um, it's based on a true story. I yeah, would say there's it some elements of truth yeah. in there. I would like to think, uh, unlike the Showtime uh, <laughs> series on HBO about the Lakers, that I was like, none of this is true, uh, <laughs> except for maybe some of the names they use. But anyway, the um, Chernobyl. I don't know the way it was shot, the way the the score. It was just so many. I didn't know a lot about it. Um, and so I thought it was fascinating. And um, I've been thinking about it a lot. I guess from from a human standpoint of how preventable it was, but also um, just an aesthetic standpoint. Um, I'm not I'm not a filmmaker guy. And so if I'm like, man, that color correction is unbelievable. <laughs> it made a big impact on me. I don't know why, uh, but... Things like that, the aesthetic of how it looks, and um, obviously the acting is brilliant. So uh, I just think about it a lot. I, I replay it a lot in my head going, why did I feel the way I felt? And I, I like to try to get to the bottom of those answers, but I love and it. How was the music? Music was great. Um, it was the same person who won the Oscar for Joker. Um, she is a great composer. Um, although I didn't think – I don't want to get any hot water. I didn't think Joker should have won the Oscar, but um, <sighs> I – I did think that the music in Chernobyl was great. What I love about it is that there's so many references or inspiration drawn from the Geiger counters and that, that mm-hmm. staticky clicking and it creates this tension. It's, it's great. So um, I liked it. And Chernobyl, where can we watch this? HBO, it's on HBO Max or HBO somewhere. Okay. It's an HBO series. Chernobyl is one of, one of my all time favorite mini series like ever made it is just so good (laughs) the team behind it is just uh, they did an amazing job well i'll have to check it out the guy who wrote that is uh also writing uh the last of us tv show okay my list oh it's two episodes in and you think you think chernobyl's good this is i heard it's (laughs) it's a high rating it's un un unrealistically high so i'm kind of worried that i'm going to be disappointed but the games, um, I love the games. I love the story. Oh, yeah. I was very excited they were making a series. Um, my only, <clears throat> I don't know who's doing the music, but um, they had this um, guy do the music for the video games that played the Ron Rocco um, from, he's from South America and oh, wow. uh, Gustavo something with an S. I can't remember his last name, but hmm. he's brilliant. And the music in those games are s- so good. And I would hope that he's doing the TV show, but I don't really know. Yeah. Hmm. I haven't got that far in my life, but I do. I'm looking forward to watch it. Jenna is out. My wife, she's like, I'm not watching it. Watch it without me. If it's zombies, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> They're not zombies. They're fungi people. <laughs> Oh, uh, this that, that guy, he's a fun guy. But, yeah, they're basically uh, zombies. <laughs> Jeff, you're so funny. You're so punny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason, up to you. Last one, then we got to get out of here. Yeah, so mine is a podcast uh, episode. It's from the podcast 20,000 Hertz. Uh, They talk about all sorts of music sound effect uh, type stuff. They did an episode on The Price is Right um, and The Price is Right theme song in particular. Uh, Because the fascinating thing is the guy who wrote The the Price is Right theme song got swindled and has never seen a dime for The Price is Right theme song. And he estimates that he has lost 40 to 50 million dollars because of that. No, he, he, he did okay. He went on to write like the Monday night football theme and all these other things. So he's, he did okay. He's got money, but it's like, yeah, 40 to $50 million would definitely change my life. And it's a pretty interesting story, how he lost the money. And mainly it was because it was one of the first things he ever did. And he didn't know what he was doing exactly. And so someone was able to just come in and be like, Hey, what if you don't do this? And I sign this and you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's definitely worth the listen. If you, if you found this conversation interesting, go listen to this episode of this podcast. Oh man. That reminds me of the documentary with the guy on the prices, right? Have you guys seen that one yet? I haven't, but I've seen ads for it. Was it the guy who cheated? No, uh, uh-uh, no, it isn't. Oh, well, I don't know if you call it cheating. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, I'll talk else. about, 
I'll talk about that next podcast because that was that was fascinating. I thought anyway, great, Jason. Thank you for bringing that to the party, Jeff. Story, not not to draw this out longer, but re- related to what Jason's saying, and this may be total fabrication, so I hesitate to say it, but also, you know, people like a good story. So I had heard the Sherman brothers had written uh, "It's a Small World," and they, you know like other things that they had done for Disney for theme parks and things like that, it was going to be used. And Walt Disney, for whatever reason said, we're not going to do the traditional agreement. I, you guys should hang. This song is so spectacular. You guys should hang on to the the rights for it. And so he actually in a, in a, like the opposite of what Jason was talking about, they sort of sort of talked them out of the normal signing away their rights and talked them into holding on to them. Um, which was a little unusual, but it, and it became obviously a huge, huge hit. So um, it can happen, I guess, both ways, but more often than not, people are getting swindled. So true. Well, thank you for this enlightening, wonderful podcast. Gosh, we got to do this again. Uh, hopefully you'll come back with us in two weeks and we'll remember everything we forgot and we'll educate you even more on whatever is in Jeff's brain. So <laughs> that he doesn't want to get into today. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for uh, for listening. Jason, I'm going to turn it back to you. Take us out. Well, thank you so much for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.